start. <clears throat> so, uh, so this is gonna be briefer than brief, but not that brief, but sort of brief. Introduction to live coding. Um, again, my name's Ryan Ross Smith, coming from here from New York to talk about this interesting way to make beats. So very quickly, we all know what coding is. Uh, as Alan Blackwell says, an abstract notation defining behavior in different circumstances, which is a conflict with the ideal of direct manipulation. So if we think about a piece of software or a controller or something like that, we have this, in a sense, kind of indirect manipulation of what we're doing. Now that is not to say this is a bad thing or the push is a bad thing, both of which I'm gonna use after this, but to kind of start talking about what it means to be writing and interpreting code or compiling code in real time. Uh, similarly, we all know what a program is. Okay, so in a sense, I just kind of said that, right? We, we can access all of these different aspects of the program through drop-down menus, through buttons, through text fields, uh, numeric fields, all those things, um, but we generally can't get under the hood, so to speak, right? Or if we can, maybe we're not getting under the hood for too long, Maybe Max for Live is kind of a nice example of that. Max in general, PD, things like that. Um, so I'm not necessarily going to say I'm making this argument, um, but certainly the argument's been made that we're kind of led towards particular kinds of expression based on how the program is designed and where it leads us. So I think it might be fair to say that someone who is just starting out making music might make a different kind of music if they're using Fruity Loops versus using Ableton versus using Pro Tools versus using uh, Audacity or something like that, right? So this will kind of come back to about the different sort of flavors of uh, languages and programs. So what is live coding? Um, so Ward, Ruber, Olufsen, McLean, Griffiths, Collins, and Alexander say, Live coding is the activity of writing parts of a program while it runs. So again, we, with live coding, we stay under the hood the entire time, okay? We never, we're, we're compiling in real time, but something else isn't showing up. We're still just seeing the code, okay? Um, Collins says, actually sort of, it's gonna be sort of contrary to what we talk about a little later, that live coding is the antithesis of revealing work to the audience. So, a big part of live coding is that people see the code, they're not just stuck looking at a screen that's been compi compiled, that's been produced by a company, they're seeing the code. Collins suggests, at least as far as I read it, that how many of us actually know how to read the code in real time? Um, there's certainly quite a few languages that when I see somebody live coding with it, I have no idea what they're doing. And I'll show a couple of those, okay? Um, this is a longer quote um, by the same group of people as long as the program has to be compiled in order to be able to run and to simulate a user interface, the time delay between creating the tool and using it seems to be very dominant. The cycle of testing, writing, and compiling is slow, and the aim is separated from its description. Because there is no need for postponing activity, an essential difference comes into play when interpreted languages allow programs to be written while they run. This is not a difference in degree, it is a quantum leap that merges tool and product. So in other words, uh, well, again, this under the hood idea, um, but I think what's really important about this is now we're thinking about using the tool as we're creating it, right? So the language itself is a tool, but then how we're actually using that language sort of becomes our tool and it is producing some type of sound or visual or whatever it happens to be in real time as we're writing it. Okay, so just to um, go to a little bit of sort of history, uh, the hub, which uh, included Perkis, Stone, Brown, Gresham, Lancaster, Trail, and Bischoff, and followed um, a wonderfully named group called the League of Automatic Music Composers, in a sense is kind of sort of a prototype for the idea of live coding. They would have a server, basically, and they were all clients, in a sense, sending information back and forth. So let's say John Bischoff could send some uh, list of numbers, okay? And then Chris Brown could get that list of numbers and do something good with it, or perhaps do something very silly with it. It doesn't really matter. Uh, but again, the idea is that they're not sending audio back and forth, they're just sending code. Okay, or lists of numbers. 
Uh, just for fun, I just found this. This is a video of a recording of their first performance, and it does at one point show their screens. So it's very kind of archaic um, in a sense. So from 1987, this is The Hub. So that's fun. Um, so they're, they're very much in the in sort of West Coast, left field, experimental um, musical context. <clears throat> uh, again, very quickly, another sort of prototypical approach would be things like laptop orchestras. Um, these began popping up in the early 2000s from New Jersey to Tokyo. Um, now, as Princeton professor Perry R. Cook notes, Laptop orchestras aren't necessarily live coding ensembles, although some have experimented with on-the-fly performative programming. And many have a number of live coding compositions in their standard repertoire. So there is some kind of live coding aspect going on here. Um, most often it exists in these kinds of places, right? Like very sort of difficult to attend universities, things of that sort, places with a lot of money. Um, obviously these students are taking it all very, very seriously and good for them. I think it's very wonderful. Um, but I think what's interesting about this, you can see a lot, you see some instruments, you see some, some controllers, and this is, I think, very typical, especially of a group like Plork, is to, in a sense, kind of merge the highfalutin academic approach to, let's say, using code to produce music or whatever it happens to be, and then also using controllers. So things like these, other off-the-shelf devices, but also video game controllers, things like maybe you wouldn't have thought of to use for this. So again, very, very brief. Um, you can't talk about live coding without looking at TopLap. This is sort of the go-to place for all information regarding live coding since about 2004. And we don't have the days we would need to go into this. So languages and algo raves. These are the two things we're gonna look at now for the rest of this. So, like I said before, there are a bunch of different flavors of languages, just like with normal computer programming, like JavaScript's very different from C++ and all that. Um, for all of the different languages that people would use for live coding, from SuperCollider to Tidal to Ixilang to Boxdot, whatever it happens to be, they enable certain things. So, in a sense, you can be led to certain kind of aesthetic responses to it. And one of those uh, aesthetics falls under something that has been coined the algo rave or an algorithmic rave, which looks a little bit something like somebody typing on their computer and making dance music and then projecting the code behind them, okay? Um, so we have all been around long enough to remember seeing computer music live and listening to the person next to you who didn't believe in it and suggesting that they were just checking their email, right, okay? I think at this point, hopefully mostly gone away, but this kind of really 
sheds a lot of light on what's actually going on. All right? So I'm just going to go through four or five examples of some of the languages that I think are really interesting. And then I'll do a quick demonstration of a language called Title Cycles, theoretically with, um, with my collaborator. So we'll see if, he, see if he shows up. OK, so the first example is called Foxdot, which the author describes as a combination of an interactive Python mini text editor and a library for making algorithmic music with code. So all of these, again, would probably fall under this kind of algo rave idea versus the kind of music that the hub was playing, okay? Something that was uh, less uh, obviously formal, okay? Let's see if we can start it. I don't know if anybody was trying to sort of parse what was going on up here, but BD stands for bass drum or kick drum, SN is snare, and you can see with the snare between the quotes, there's space, 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 zero, space. So the zero ostensibly is occurring on the third beat. Okay, so it's kind of like a spatial uh, notation. Uh, the next example is called Ixilang by Thor Magnuson, who has written quite a bit about the idea that code is a kind of notation. And you'll see a very similar sort of spatial thing where he adds spaces for rests, and then it's a little less clear what exactly it's triggering, but hopefully this is a good example. The next is Conductive by Renick Bell, which he describes as a set of Haskell libraries for live coding and real-time music applications. This language is very, very difficult to understand. Uh, it seems to be built on abstraction over abstraction over abstraction. So there's a lot of material that we're not actually seeing, but he is calling functions that ostensibly he's created beforehand. Um, but what's really great about this language is that on the right side, you're going to see where he's inputting his, his code. And on the left side, you're going to see the printout. And it appears that he prints out pretty much every single thing that happens. So it's a lot of text. These huge, huge uh, text dumps happen. And this is a little bit louder than the last one. Okay, Jibber by Charlie Roberts is the first thing we're going to look at that is a browser-based coding environment using a standalone JavaScript library 
which also includes support for 2D, 3D, and shader programming and representation. I'm going to skip this one because we're going to look at that in a moment. So title cycles is what I'm going to end on and then do a quick demonstration. So this is um, created by Alex McLean, a huge part of the live coding community, um, in a sense responsible for me even knowing about it and a lot of people knowing about it. So this is written in Haskell. Super Collider hosts the Super Dirt synth for title cycles. It's sample based, which is why I'm ending with this, okay? So even though it can do synthesis and it can send MIDI to other applications and also externally uh, and OSC, the way I'm using it and the way a lot of people use it is based on a huge bank of samples. Um, and it is uh, relatively straightforward as far as programming languages go. So there may be some things about it when you're looking at it, say, oh, okay, I think I kind of get that. And that would be good. So I just have to switch over really quick to see if, I can find my guy. Okay, I think this is gonna work. Ah, yes, okay, good. All right, I don't know how well you can see it. So uh, my collaborator, Sean Lawson, is in um, upstate New York right now, and we are connected on a shared browser window using title cycles and a language that Sean wrote called the force. So the force is what you're gonna see, uh, the visuals, basically. So all the, all the code you see right there, except for the one that says D1, is, and it BPS, is called the force. Okay, so what's happening there, I can't really even explain it. It's a lot of math and I don't really understand math. Um, but what I can say is that what I end up doing and the sounds that I make are picked up by the microphone and are influencing what the visuals are doing, okay? So very basically, or a very basic kind of overview. Sorry. So if I'm basically just gonna write, so D1, can you guys see where my cursor is? D1 sound, and then I'm gonna write K1 times four, and as long as nothing broke, we should hear kick drums. It seems that something broke, and it's probably Super Collider. Ah. 
Okay, so pretty straightforward. If we wanted to have this alternate between, let's say, a kick and a snare, we might do K1, S1. If we wanted a hat, we could do K1, S1, H1, S1. If we do times two, we'll have eighth notes instead of quarter notes. Okay, so that sort of thing. Um, and then once you have your patterns going, you can layer patterns, in, which we're going to do, and then apply functions to them. So I'm just gonna focus on a few functions, basically just pitch shifting and some granular stuff, and also demonstrate that in addition to short samples like those, you can trigger longer samples. So hopefully this little six, seven minute thing will give you kind of a sense of the sort of live coding stuff that I'm doing and that other people are doing in this uh, sort of field of practice. Okay. So Sean's probably sitting on his couch in upstate New York, relaxing, it's very nice. It's a good system, and I have a cheat sheet because if you get an error, you can't compile. The other thing about this is it takes a little time to get things going.
short example of um, live coding. Everyone says hello. We are done for a minute. I'm saying this to Sean. But don't leave. I'm saying this to you. OK, so that kind of concludes uh, the introduction to live coding. So thanks for checking it out. <laughs>